think of Wardour Street and you think of film. For the whole of the 20th century, this famous thoroughfare has been the center of the film business. Oh, the names have changed. Cricks and Martin, Hepworth and Charles Urban have long since gone, replaced by their modern counterparts. But one illustrious name survives, founded by a Frenchman, Charles Pathé, seen here on the right, who for the first time in Great Britain established a newsreel called the Pathé Animated Gazette. Today we are able to recall from the Pathé archives scenes from the last years of Queen Victoria's reign. Crudely photographed with a hand-cranked camera, these moving pictures do give a glimpse of the closing Victorian era. W.G. Grace in practice at Lord's in 1898, the only known film of this famous cricketing doctor. Before the First World War, women's rights were a regular item of Pathé newsreels. Unstinting coverage was given to the suffrage campaigns. In the escalating desperation to be recognized, Pathé filmed during the 1913 derby the extreme sacrifice of Emily Davidson, throwing herself under the king's horse. It was but one great landmark in the history of Pathé Scoops. Today, Pathé News is no longer in production, but a total of 52 million feet of 35mm film exists from those years, and is under the charge of Chief Librarian Harry Winder, a veteran who's been in the film business all his life. Pathé Library has always been a major subscriber to all forms of television productions, TV commercials, feature films, and has been doing so for many, many years. It is all one of the largest organisations in the, in the business for that purpose. The demand for news stories covering the history of the 20th century is continuous. No documentary or historical programme would be contemplated without recourse to the library. The thousands of film stories are a tribute to the worldwide network of cameramen who showed the greatest loyalty to Pathé News. Great rivalry existed between the newsreel companies and was further complicated when the filming of an event was purchased on an exclusive basis. In 1924, Pathé failed to obtain the cup final rights at Wembley. Undeterred, a cameraman and equipment were smuggled into the ground and later an astounded rival was amazed to see pirated film of his exclusive cup final. It all added up to a lot of fun in beating a rival to the screen. Another scoop was the arrival of the Hindenburg airship over New Jersey in 1937, which was just a normal news on assignment, which turned into a disaster. The story began in a quite ordinary way. The arrival on a scheduled flight of the giant airship Hindenburg at Lakehurst, New Jersey. The newsreel company's interest was simply to cover the first flight of the season. The crossing had taken 16 hours and had proved quite uneventful. The routine landing procedures had taken the airship down to 75 feet. Herb Morrison of radio station WLS takes up the story. It's starting to rain again. The rain had uh, flagged up a little bit. The back motors of the ship are just holding it uh, just enough to keep it from... The first the plane. Wait, get it started, get it started. It's flying, and it's flying, it's flying, it's terrible. Oh, my, get out of the way, please. It's running, bursting into flames, and, and it's falling on the morning fast, and all the folks between us, this is terrible. This is the worst of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's, it's, it's like running, oh, four, four or five hundred feet into the sky. It is, it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now, and the flame is crashing to the ground. It's not quite to the morning fast. All the humanity and all the fans are screaming around you. I don't. I cannot talk to people. There's fish around there. Sabotage, lightning, or as the later inquiry tried to establish, escaping gas ignited by an electrical discharge. The cause was never proved beyond doubt. It provided a shock news film that even today is one of the most spectacularly filmed disasters of all time. 
but in reality the death toll was just 36 people. Apart from the obvious news stories, Pathy didn't shrink from the seamy side of life. In Great Britain, the unemployed were secretly filmed for a documentary about housing. The sheer, unremitting misery of their plight was captured, together with the means test and welfare handouts to the poor. Today, these pictures seem almost unreal in their extremity of destitution, but could well be recalled by people watching this program. At this time, newsreels, including Pathé, would cover the season, fashions, spectacular sights, royalty. To actually shock the nation by screening slum housing and poverty took great courage. The slogan, Homes Fit for Heroes, had a very hollow ring to the poor of our great cities. Before television, the cinema was one of the few ways of reminding the public in the most graphic terms of the other side of life in Great Britain. Very little library film exists to show slum conditions of the 1920s and 30s. This isn't surprising, as such film is hardly commercial, but Pathé did have a conscience and were almost alone in filming the life of the poor. The Prince of Wales, while on a tour of the slum areas, was moved to say, what can I do? What can be done? Something must be done. The words shocked a nation and brought great and popular acclaim to a real Prince of the People. The war helped solve the unemployment problem. With Britain's back to the wall, Pathy secured the only film record of the Dunkirk retreat. A total ban had been imposed on any news coverage, but Pathy cameraman Charles Martin smuggled his camera aboard one of the little ships and was able to film the evacuation from just off the Dunkirk beaches. Warned about confiscation, he removed the film from his camera, dropped all his equipment into the water, and managed to get his precious reels of film past the authorities and into Britain. Today, Charles Martin's courage and tenacity provides for all time the only film of the miracle of Dunkirk. During the 1920s and 30s, we were fortunate enough to entice many famous music hall styles into our studio to be filmed for our Patty Pictorials. <laughs> Now this is how I looks at it, and I think you'll agree with me. I've never seen a man get drunk in my life on cow cow coffee or tea. Gus Elam, a top musical star who rose to fame with his poignant Cockney songs in the 1890s. This costa comedian enjoyed top billing for over 40 years. I always feel happy and I always feel right when I've had a glass or two. So why should I drink coffee or tea when there's plenty of ale for you? Now the break. First, I never think of having tea. I likes me all the point of aisle. For dinner, I likes a little bit of meat and all the point of aisle. For tea, I likes a little bit of fish and all the point of aisle. And for supper, I likes a crust of bread and cheese and a barrel and an awful aisle. Pathé's foresight in inviting some of the greatest names in music hall to visit the small, cramped, fifth-floor Water Street studio today offers, in many cases, the only posthumous record of a legendary music hall star. A tea I like, a little bit of fish, and all the points of aisle. And for supper I like, a crust of bread and cheese, and a velvet and I suppose everybody has their favourite piece of film. Mine was of a faultless bomber launched in 1942. Luckily, the cameraman did not run out of film.
Passé stopped New Zeal production on the 26th of February, 1970. They could no longer compete with television. But the library lives on, offering over 80 years of moving picture history. A constant stream of researchers, historians, and television companies make use of the millions of feet of celluloid history. Yeah, these shots are quite good. We have some others of, um, uh, from other reels, which uh, uh, might not be the same year, but the same period, which look quite good. So yeah. you can... Relatively uh, unknown at the time, an inventor called Baird was filmed in 1929 at his Long Acre workshops. Pictures transmitted through the air was just another mad invention and passing craze. The news item was one short story in the twice-weekly cinema newsreel, but the system was refined and now spans the world as newsreels once did. What is even more astonishing is Charles Pathé's experiments with colour. In 1908, every single picture, and there are 16 to a second, was coloured by hand. Coupled with trick photography, they make a most charming reminder of the cinema's pioneering early years. Television may have won the battle, but Pathé was there first. <laughs> 